I'm Harry Forbes from ARC Advisor Group. Welcome to this session on business value through edge analytics. Um, I'm going to have a few, what, what the format of this session is going to be is I'm going to have a few remarks at the beginning. Then we're going to hear from Schlumberger. Then we're going to hear from Lucky Peak Power, two kind of diverse applications. Then we're going to have a panel discussion with Q&A. So um, I... I just wanted to say something about this. Just, I won't take very much of your time, but uh, Ed just kind of, it, you know, in all the COVID stuff, uh, despite all the disruptions and all the other things that changed in COVID period, Edge computing kind of got, if you will, it got kind of sexy during this period. It, it, it got a lot of hype. So like everything that gets hype, there's a lot of um, hype. And so you hear these statistics like, well, in you know, 10 years, 80% of the data will be processed at the edge or it'll be 82% or something like that. But um, despite the hype, there really is a, uh, there really is something here and I just wanna talk about it for a minute. And especially when it comes to automation, what we've seen is, uh, the innovation cycles are ridiculously slow. So we, we were joking about this. This was the automation architecture in 1995, and then you go 25 years later and we change the color of the hose, but everything else is pretty much the same. Maybe we have a new, you know, we have newer versions of the Microsoft Windows operating system running on the panels and, and that kind of stuff. And we probably have cybersecurity applications and so forth. I'm being a little unfair, but really, uh, we haven't seen the kind of revolutionary change in automation architectures that we've seen in IT architectures. And the innovation cycles tend to be very slow. Now, my personal opinion is this is going to change. Uh, that's probably a little bit a risky uh, thing to say because they don't usually change, and here's why they don't. Um, you have a, a real high cost for downtime and failures, and depending on what the industry is, it's always a high cost, but it can be millions of dollars per day or even millions of dollars per hour. Reluctant players, which means that both the end users and the suppliers um, like the situation to some degree where they have a, a walled garden and that the suppliers have a, a, a silo they can deal with, and the end users have one throat to choke. They have somebody they know they can deal with. And we have very long equipment life cycles. Someone was saying at one of the sessions this morning that the consumer electronics turnover, product turnover, is measured in months. The industrial product turnover, industrial automation product turnover is measured in, in years or even decades, so 10 years or more. Um, certifications are necessary but evil in the um, uh, industrial space. They're absolutely necessary, but they definitely add to delay. And of course, the usual lack of global standards. We have plenty of standards to choose from, but not, not very many global. And these are some comments that came out of our U uh, European uh, research with end users. Some of my European colleagues talked to some people about the lack of innovation. And, and this is some of the things they said. You know, we can't add complexity. We need a clear business case. We need measurable change. We have to buy proven technology. And we test and pilot things for years. And sometimes we just want to do everything ourselves. And of course, a lot of times in the manufacturing environment, what people are doing is, uh, uh, this, the cliche would be putting out fires. They're doing whatever it takes today to keep the production process running on spec and at volume as best they can. So it's not a, an environment many times that's really conducive to rapid innovation. But I'd like to share uh, a couple of points that a, a presenter made at the forum in, uh, I think it was the last in-person forum that we had at ARC, which I thought were very perceptive. This was a uh, gentleman from a major automotive company, Audi. And his, he said, if I need a specific function today, then I buy an appliance or a device with that specific function. So these, you can think of these appliances as being I.O. nests, uh, PLCs, uh, firewalls, whatever. But 
we are kind of in an appliance mode in the, in the automation architecture. And what he was trying to drive his company toward was buying a standardized offering and adding functionality through software because he already had the infrastructure that he needed on which to execute. So in a way, we're seeing this come true. Uh, not so much right now in the uh, automation space purely, but we're seeing it come true in, may, in many, many ways in analytics and other kinds of applications where we have a more standardized, uh, I wouldn't call it an appliance, a more standardized hardware software platform at the edge, executing perhaps some automation application and perhaps some other kinds of analytic applications, and they may be the more valuable ones. The other thing this guy said, and, and he was looking forward to a virtualized and containerized software environment for his edge devices. And people said, well, why do you need that? Because they already had a lot of industrial PCs. And he's, he gave a census of something like 45,000 edge points or industrial PCs that he had in his factories. And I don't remember the exact statistic, but he said something like a third of that number could not even be serviced remotely at all. So that they had 10, over, you know, 10, 15,000 systems that they had to go service in person. And the number of people and the difficulty and the lack of, uh, uh, the, the ability, the lack of ability to manage those systems remotely and to manage that number of systems remotely was an extreme pain point for him. He had a whole organization that was trying to, you know, to update all that infrastructure, which was ex extreme pain point for him. And as he said at the bottom, it's an incredible amount of money we're spending doing this, and it's not going to go away. It's going to get more and more intensive, the kinds of upgrades and changes that they need. So he was looking forward to that kind of containerized environment in which he'll have not only a, a standardized platform, hardware software platform at the edge, but will have the ability to manage it remotely and manage it at scale. So this, in, in my view, this was pretty much kind of the edge computing vision that uh, he frankly admitted he was not close to yet, but I think is what people are hoping for, especially in industries, uh, manufacturing, and in industries where there's distributed infrastructure. We, we have done some research in ARC on edge controllers, and we did a study, a market study on this, and we found a bunch of products that are kind of like combining edge control and edge uh, compute capability, um, and I, I'm not going to mention them all. You can, we'll be able to, you will be able to get these slides later, but um, two of those are represented here in the presentations that we're going to see. Phoenix Contact with uh, PLC Next, which you may have heard about in the luncheon today or otherwise, and uh, Zdata with a, um, an edge, a virtualized edge platform. But, they do have company, um, and there are a lot of, uh, there's, there's an increasing number of automation companies and other types of companies, software startups and so on, who are creating and partnering to deliver that kind of vision that the fellow from Audi was, was looking for. By the way, of course, we have a market study on this at ARC, so if anybody wants further data, I'm sure we'd be happy to sell you the market study. The other kind of thing we're seeing more at the edge is what we would call a, a classic IT hyperconverged infrastructure. So it's a small footprint appliance or system that incorporates compute, networking, and storage, and virtualization. Um, if you look at some of the startups that we're, we see at, at uh, events like Hanover Mesa, and other automation events, we're finding this more and more 
uh, that the applications, albeit proprietary, are being virtualized. And there's, a, that, there's value in that if you think back to the fellow from Audi who has the 15,000 systems that he can't service remotely. Even if they're proprietary, even if they don't change, if he can virtualize that number of systems, then he's getting a lot of value because he has at least observability and perhaps serviceability of the applications remotely. The other part is you get help from the IT organization in, in managing the infrastructure, at least part of it, because it's not foreign to them. So, um, in, to summarize, like where is the end user value? Where is the end user value coming from this? Um, and you can envision a system where the whole system is put together uh, by different suppliers. And it, it, there were several examples of that on the on the showcase floor. If you if you did happen to look, uh, where there was a mixture of suppliers that were automation suppliers and IT suppliers and software suppliers delivering a solution like this. Um, not highly standardized at this point, but we're moving in that direction. So uh, the final thing I would say about the edge is that um, it depend where it is actually located depends on who you are talking to, what industry you're talking in. So it's always good to ask for a context there because if you're talking to somebody who's in telecommunications, he's talking about something entirely different than somebody who's in uh, automotive or somebody who's in utilities. So there is very different amounts of compute and storage and infrastructure that they consider the edge. And in our case, you know, in automation, it includes a lot of what you call um, Restricted function devices that are that are really embedded systems with a specific function and, and not too much more than that.